Hello, my name is Steve Baskoff, and I'm with the Digital Scholarship and Communications Office at the Jean and Alexander Hurd Libraries of Vanderbilt University. In this lesson, we're going to pick up where we left off in the last lesson with more information about data wrangling, and we'll end the lesson talking about piping and how that's used to streamline the flow through your R scripts. If you came to this video by some means other than our lessons page, you might be interested to know that this is a part of a series of lessons called Code Graph. You can find out more about these lessons by going to vanderbilt.lt slash codegraph. We are going to continue with looking at how we can change tibbles from one form to another. We introduced the diplier package last time, and this time we're going to look at several built-in functions that can be used uh, in addition to the ones we learned about last time. So the ones that we learned about last time were filter, select, mutate, and transmute. Now we're going to use one of the built-in functions of our replace along with these others to change the condition of items that are a part of our data set. To explore these new functions, I've created a small data set of fake grades data, and we're going to pretend that we are a teacher trying to analyze some grades from a class. So I created the spreadsheet in my normal spreadsheet program and then saved it as a CSV file and uploaded it as a GitHub gist. We will be able to use this data in our script by clicking on the raw button and then copying the URL from that raw file so that we'll get the raw CSV data into our program. One thing that you should notice about this spreadsheet is that there are several cells that are empty there's one test cell that's empty here and two paper cells that are empty here. We spent quite a bit of time talking about the empty cells and CSVs and how they are read into data frames by R. So we'll have to pay attention to that when we start to work with these data. We need to begin our work in our studio by loading the libraries that we need in order to use the functions that are necessary in this exercise. If you have downloaded the tidyverse collection of packages, you can just simply execute the library tidyverse command and all of them will be loaded. You can also load only the packages that we're going to use. So we're going to use readr, which is the way we're going to get the data from this raw github gist file into our Tibble data frame. And then we are also going to use the diplier package in order to use the mutate and transmute functions that are a part of it. Okay, so I've loaded those two libraries. Now I'm ready to read in the file. So in order to avoid having to use this long character string over and over again, I'm going to assign it to a variable called file name. And then we can just simply say read CSV file name. This is also convenient if you want to test something out with several different files. You can just use the file name variable in your code and then change the value of file name as you try it out with different data. I can see what happened in two ways. One is I can go over here and click on the data structure here. I can see that those cells that were blank or I could also say empty strings were read in as NA or not available values in the uh, tibble that was created. This is a very convenient way to look at the data. However, I don't want to have to keep switching back and forth uh, between this tab and the script. So I've, throughout the script, just put in some lines to simply have R show me the state of the data. So here I can see it rather succinctly down in my console window. So here again are the NAs emphasized in red. I want to build up a function that's going to allow me, first of all, to deal with um, these NAs. So we're going to imagine this scenario that this is a test that is passed 
and this particular student here didn't take the test. So they failed to take the test, they failed to make up the test, so this student should get a zero. Um, I'm going to actually treat these NAs over here for the paper differently because those we're going to pretend are from a paper that um, students have until the end of the semester to finish. So these actually are missing data. They, we, we expect those data to come in later on. We just don't know what they are right now. So these NAs are correctly identified as missing data, but this NA actually should be a value of zero. So what I'm going to do here is to use this function isNA, which we saw before. First, I'm going to have R tell me what the values are in the grades column. So the grades column is effectively a vector. And here I've asked R to show me what is in that vector. And here's what I have. If I use the isNA function on this vector, then I will produce a series of Booleans that correspond to each of the items in the vector. And that Boolean is going to have value based on whether the item in the vector is an NA or not. So I can see the first three items in the vector are not NAs, so it returns false. But the fourth item in the vector is NA, so it returns true. And then the rest of the items are not NAs, so it returns false. So when I carry out the isNA function, I generate an, a, a vector of values that has the same number of items as my original vector, except that the values are Booleans. Each one of the Booleans corresponds to the same relative position in the original vector. The replace function simply uses the value of this vector that I've created, this Boolean vector, to decide in each case in the original vector whether it should be replaced or not. So the first value of the replace function, the first argument, is the vector to be acted upon. And then the second value is the Boolean array. So it simply goes through each of the items here. If a corresponding item has a value of true, then it performs the replacement, and the last argument is the value that should be used for the replacement. So if I carry this out and then look to see what the result was, I can see that where I had an NA before, I now have a zero. So it did replace the NA based on whether it was an NA or not with the value that I requested, which was zero.